joking, really. Timberwell. Jefferson. Okay, well, this, this reading is for you. If you promise uh, not to make any noise okay. from now for the next half an hour. Okay. Right. Hi, I'm Nick Cave. I'm going to read from my book, And the Ass Saw the Angel. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I don't really want to say much about this. I really hope you can understand what I'm talking about here. No, I can't, look, I can't, uh, I can't talk with you there. I can't. It's a personal thing. Really. Um, okay, this story is seen through the eyes of a boy who can't speak. His name is Euclid Eucro, uh, and in his own words, he's the loneliest boy in the history of the world. And he can't speak. Yeah, this uh, this piece concerns his birth. Uh, he's born. Uh, he's born one of twins. Yeah, and this concerns his birth. Okay, there. You're right there. It was his brother who tore the call on that the morning of their birth. And as if that sole act of assertion was to set an inverted precedent for inertia in his life to come, Euclid, then unnamed, clutched a hold of his brother's heels and slopped into the world with all the glory of an uninvited guest. The noonday sun spun in the sky like a molten bolt and hammered down upon the tin roof and tarred plank sides of the shack, Inside sat Pa at his table, surrounded by his ingenious contraptions of springs and steel, sweating midst the bleeding heat while greasing his traps and trying in vain to closet his ears from the drunken ravings of his wife, who lay sprawled and caterwauling in the back seat of the old burnt-out Chevy. Pride of the junk pile, that car, sitting on bricks out back of the shack like a great shell shed in disgust by some outsized crawler. There in the squirms of labor, his bibulous spouse shrieked against the miracle that swelled and kicked inside her as she sucked on a bottle of her own white Jesus, rocking the Chevy on its stilts and moaning and screaming, screaming and moaning, pa, pa, until she heard the shack door open and then the shack door shut where she took leave of the morning and passed into unconsciousness. That's right. It's really hard for me as well because I know you can't understand a word that I'm talking about. And this, this makes it very difficult for me as well. But all I can do is read it. Right. Okay. Too pissed to push, Pa would tell you could later. Prizing the liquor bottle free of her grubby clutch, for even out cold she hung on and hung on, Pa broke the bottle carefully on his car's rusted tail fin. Taking intuition as his midwife and a large shard of, his, of glass as his cutter, he spread his prostrate wife with child and doused her private parts in peel liquor. And with a chain of oaths spilling from his mouth, and with all the summer insects humming, with the sun in the sky and not a cloud in sight, with a hellish shriek and a gush of gleet, two slobbering bundles came tumbling out. Jesus, too, cried Pa, but one died soon. Inside the shack, two fruit crates lined with newspaper sat side by side on the table. The animal traps had been moved and hung around the walls. Two boxes, and in each a babe. Pa peered in. Neither made a sound, and both lay quite still upon their backs, 
naked as the day and with eyes wide and wondering. Pa drew the nibbled stub of a pencil from his trouser pocket and squinting leaned toward the little ones writing on the foot end of the firstborn's crib number one, then licking the tip number two upon the crib in which Euclid lay. Then he stood back and stared from one to the other and one and the other reciprocated earnestly. Theirs were strange almond eyes with slightly swollen upper lids and next to no lashes, blue but so pale as almost to verge on pink, intent, eager, never still, not for a moment. Rather they seemed to hover these weird chattering eyes, hover and tremble in their browless sockets. Little Euclid coughed, short and sharp, his tiny pink tongue lapping at his lower lip, then curling back inside. And as if waiting for a signal and recognizing it in Euclid's timid hack, the brave little firstborn closed his eyes and fell into a sleep from which he would never wake. Goodbye, brother, I said to myself as he slipped away. And for a full minute, I thought that I too was going under. So fucking cold was his dying. Then sailing through the still night came the raucous fray of her bitch ship, Ma Mother, Ma, screeching in hoarse malediction through the very anus of obscenity, whilst banging on the side of the Chevy and going, Where's Ma Bottle? Where's Ma Bottle? Right on. Fucking hell. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, Euclid, uh, Euclid's mother, Euclid is the uh, central character of this book. He's an introvert, uh, an introvert, and... Uh, yeah, he can't speak, I told you that. And uh, he lives in a world of his own. And he has a, uh, a, a terrible mother who is a drunk and a drunk, uh, an ugly, fat drunk. Right on, yeah, right. And uh, this is uh, about his terrible mother. Listen, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but if I told you that my mother was a great whopping whale of a cunt, or she was precisely that, a great whopping whale of a hog's cunt with a dry black maggot for a brain. The, slob the slobstress was wont to play pedagogue when she'd hit the piss just enough to be able to stand and to speak. It was a woeful thing to see. One particular evening when Pa had retired early, Ma decided she wanted to teach me about my heritage, about my ancestry, my family tree, and so forth. I was sitting in the hardback chair and we were playing this sort of game she used to enjoy. Weaving about in front of me with her brown stone bottle in one paw and an old plastic fly swat in the other, she would first give the lesson, which could take anything up to an hour, sometimes two, and then she would shoot questions at me. If the answer was yes, I was to raise my right hand, and if the answer was no, I was to raise my left. If I answered incorrectly and raised the wrong hand, she would deliver a stinging blow to the top of my scalp with the fly swat. If I did not answer at all, which was often, as both my hands had been tied to the front legs of the chair, she would swat me around the right ear or the left ear, depending on which she thought was the correct answer. Sometimes, towards the end of the bottle, she would find she had forgotten the answer herself, and then I would receive a blow to both ears. When at last she couldn't remember the question, or for that matter, even the topic of the lesson, or eventually why I was tied to a chair and she had a fly swat in her hand at all, she would fly into a frenzy of slaps, swats, strikes, backhanders, flying tackles and stomps, until at last she would collapse exhausted in her armchair. I would then have to wait until Pa decided it was safe to enter the room and untie me. Anyway, I don't want to sink here and sling a lot of crap at a corpse. Because that's all she is now, a mess of maggots. 
Oh yes, and a soul, a shrieking, burning soul. I want to tell you about what Ma revealed to me on this particular evening about my ancestry, about my bloodline on my father's side. Strange things. Things I always suspected about my heritage, about my blood. Yes, about my blood. You can put a bit of music with this one. Uh, this uh, this piece concerns. Uh, this has some music to it, and uh, it can. Uh, it's uh, it's about uh, Euclid burying the family mule and discovering his dead brother's little body. Pa beat mule to death in autumn for copper and gold were the leaves. I remember because it was the fallen leaves slippery with morning dew that made it possible to drag mule's carcass. I remember because it was... Uh, pa beat mule to death in autumn for copper and gold were the leaves. I remember because it was the fallen leaves slippery with morning dew that made it possible to drag Mule's carcass over to the old water tower. His back had been brutally beaten. I suspected a broken spine. I took the long-handled shovel and began digging, my attention being diverted at times from the business of burial by Mule's cold stare. He was dead and the dead must be buried. Everybody knows that, yet his eyes seemed to beg for mercy as if it were Ah who had beaten the life out of the poor brute and not Pa. My spade up turned darker earth, and without any other warning, there upon the blade of my shovel lay what looked like the skeleton of a small dog. Squatting aside the grave and loosing the rust-colored earth from the fanning bones, I discovered a child's tiny skull next a rotting radius and ulna connected to a brittle little hand. And by the time I had exhumed my brother's earthly remains, lifting out all his bones intact and laying them out on the soft floor of fallen golden foliage, I was sobbing noiselessly, my eyes streaming. I buried Mule's carcass and laid my brother's skeleton out in an old cutlery drawer I had found on the heap. I built a simple sliding lid for it, and taking the box with me into the swampland, I propped it against the inside back wall of Mass Sanctum. He remained there, my treasured companion, for a good three months. That is, until the day that she spooked the Turk's nag into the swamp, and the townsfolk found my haven and destroyed it. But that all comes later. I love you, little brother, and I'm coming home. Do you understand any of this? Yeah. Not you. This is written in Australian. Did you understand? Did, did you notice that? But uh, do the other? Do you, uh, do the Swedes understand it? You don't, do you? Because I've got another two dates to do of this. And this is suddenly turning into a kind of nightmare for me. You do. Right, okay. This is uh, Euclid, uh, Euclid, the boy, uh, the character in this book, is uh, obsessive about a lot of things and he has a great affection for animals. And uh, this piece concerns, uh, I'm sorry, he likes animals, yeah. More than likes them. It doesn't, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. Now, this is actually about a spider. Like,
Yeah, right. I was barely 10 years old when I became the keeper of an Atra Virago, more commonly known as the Vargas Barking Spider. But I had to let him go, for I could not compete. My Atra Virago was given to me by a hobo in exchange for a pint of peel liquor, which I milked off one of Ma's stills the same evening. If I had just been a little stronger, I know I could have healed him. The exchange went as it should have, although I sensed it was a solemn moment for the hobo. The way in which his hands trembled as he handed me the fatty skillet, barely able to hold down the lid, betrayed a certain sensitivity that was rare amongst the hobos, who in the main were a worthless, roguish lot. I made for my spider's home an ingenious coop. This is how. Listen. I found on the junk pile an old hubcap and a battered kitchen colander that put face to face, fitted perfectly and formed a slightly flattened globoid with a solid bottom and heavily perforated ceiling for breathing and looking. I tore up a newspaper into even strips and lined the hubcap with them, making a soft springy floor. My barking spider was as big as a dinner plate and fitted the coop exactly. I fed him mainly on houseflies with the occasional earwig or blue bottle and kept the coop under my bed for the first day. I did not leave my room for three days and three nights. After a time, there in the dark, I would find and strike a match along the side of the coop, holding it up close to the perforation so that the dancing flame would cast its quivering light within. With lungs raw from the acrid fumes, I would draw to and peer in, into the coop, into its weird orbits, those pits, those black water wounds, unblinking, fearless. Again, again, dizzy with sulfurous air again. I believe I could have left this life by way of those damp, drugged pits, the mires of its eyes, those onyx pools, dragged down by the pull of those dark-lit spirals, for they held me. They did, paralyzed, numb, blisters bubbled on fore and thumb, little black cinders littered my sheets, I listened again, again I peered in. It was such a truly wondrous spider, jet black it was, its caudal region given over to a silky ebony hair. Only its eyes flashed, but blackly too, like raw coal or ice soot, blackly I say, and only sometimes. But it always shunned me. Never once did I see it move in the coop. Never once did I hear it bark. On the fourth day, I decided to shift the coop inside. The silence of the barking spider was destroying me. First, I thought it was the coop that displeased him. Then I thought that maybe he was just a mute like me. Next, waking in a cold sweat, on the second night, I was haunted by another thought, a thought which hung heavy in my heart. Perhaps it was waiting for me to speak first. Oh, lonesome spider, if only I could have let you know. Finally, I took him outside, the coop in a pillowcase. I sat on the log near the one-armed gallows tree and unbagged the coop. The coop shone in the sun like a silver helmet and a spear of light did flash upon it. I checked the crows. Opening the coop by way of halving it, I shook the spider from the hubcap and little strips of newspaper fluttered down like streamers and the corpses of a hundred insects fell like wedding rice about me. My Atra Virago landed right side up on his feet in the manner of all dropped spiders, or so I've found. And without so much as a nod, my spider crawled the length of the log and disappeared into the cane. And I sat there a while just so on the log. And then after a while or so, I sauntered up the slope to the junk pile with nothing all that pressing to do. And I tossed the two halves of the coop over and mulled around. I roasted in the sun.
In his uh, final years, Eucharist uh, built for himself a, a kingdom in this valley. And uh, he called this kingdom Doghead. And uh, within the kingdom, which was surrounded by a great wall of junk, he, uh, uh, he kept a lot of boxes and crates, like boxes full of uh, his animals. Like, uh, he had a, like, a shack, a little house, uh, where he kept all these things in. And uh, anyway, he, uh, he was the king of this uh, kingdom, and uh, he just hung around there and stuff like that. Uh, this concerns the inside of the shack, where the boxes of animals are, right? Yeah. Windowless. My shack is windowless. Once there was a window, three in fact, but I sealed them up with planks. I cemented the ledges in broken bottles just in case. With the trapdoor and the ceiling shut and the front door closed and the padlocks, bolts and chains checked, I could render the panting interior almost devoid of light. Penetrated only by the steaming needles and fast fins, the guillotines and steak knives of leaked light. Sun silver lances, like I was the bikini clad assistant in some magician's trick gone horribly wrong. Yes, sometimes I would watch steely sunlight, ragged, serrated, saw me in half. I spent an afternoon plugging the major leaks with plaster, but the minor clefts, pox and crannies, the sly seeps and trickles, the countless chinks in, chinks in my castellated armor are left unhindered. Perforations. Air holes hammered into the lid of my coop, of my coffin. If the beasts were up to it, we would talk. In this hushed sepulchral stillness, with the air putrid, septic, heady and receptive, a lot of thought waves got moved around. Rat chat, cackling crack streak, <laughs> snake hissants, lizard fizz, chipping rabbit blather, hair air, bug thrum, beast din muzzled, telepathic. Oh, but the drooling dog thoughts, dull, belligerent, doped, full of mean transmission, blood, meat, sex, and so on. Lame, cockeyed hill bitches, agitated into a perpetual state of ostrous, turning mean and nasty as they froth and butt and rut and hump in the ordure and straw, gnash and gravel in their squatting capsules on the floor. When the merging got out of hand, I would give them a goofball, a carmative, okay, a comative, one part water, one part white Jesus, a half to one powdered sedative. It never failed. A bowl or two of that, they lapped it up, and they'd be goo-gooing like sucklings all pooped out. All the mad air slaked, the feral static, the hate waves abated. I would sit there and nod and nanny these lumpen fadges of incumbent dung. There were no in-between moods, no slippers brought to the bedside, no hobble around the block. Either those brutes were in a state of high coma or they were coming at your face. But that's the way they had to be. That's the way I wanted it. It's the way God had it organized. That pack of riggish bitches and low bloods. Oh, they will have their chance to make good. Like me, they will have their moment of glory too. And very soon, I think, and very soon. Let the sleeping dogs lie and don't believe a word they say. I am the truth. I am the light. Every dog has its day. I'm having mine now. My time is nigh. You're too late, Mr. Hayrake, Mr. Spade. I said, hey, boss, take up that cross and put on your walking shoes. Yes, you lose, Mr. Noose. Today belongs to me, not thee, me, me. This day is mine. Into the ranks of the elite I climb, climbing, uh, saying, uh, this is the last day. This is the last day. The last day is mine. There are plenty of others, brothers. Take your pick. Take your hoe. Take your goddamn gallow. Leave this day alone. Sift through all your yesterdays. Don't count on your tomorrows. I can see them coming, and it's not a very pretty sight. The fear is here. The fright. Here is the night. 
Okay, thank you. Good night.